Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to our session. Uh, I'm Al Trujillo, and uh, this is my colleague, Dave Dillon. And we are uh, hosting the session of special features of TAA award-winning textbooks. So what we have in store for this and how we came up with the idea is we thought, well, you know, we do all this uh, recognition of these textbooks and the awards and, and that they're very special. Well, what about them makes them special? And uh, how many of you who are here are authors of books here? Yes, most people. So uh, as an author, both uh, Dave and myself, we're always looking for ideas about what kinds of things are other textbooks doing, especially not in our discipline. One of the unique things and great things about TAA is that there are all these different disciplines that do things differently. So we put the session together. This is our second um, conference where we're doing this and asking some of the textbook uh, awardees to talk a little bit about their books. So uh, today we have three different books that will be discussed. The first is uh, Gateway to Music, an introduction to American vernacular, Western art, and world musical traditions, first edition by Jocelyn Nelson. And that was the winner of a most promising new textbook award. Uh, the second presentation will be Data Structures and Abstractions with Java fifth edition by Frank Carano and Timothy Henry. So that's a joint presentation by both of them. And uh, the third is uh, Studies Weekly by Monica Sherwin. And those last two are TAA Texty Award winners. So without further ado, we are going to start in. So I'm going to call Monica, or excuse me, Jocelyn up to the stage. And uh, it's all yours. Well, hello, everyone. Um, it's great to be here. And I, I, I would like to make sure this is on. Make sh um, OK. Um, I want to thank, I want to start off by thanking TAA for being so supportive to textbook authors. Um, so I teach at East Carolina University. I teach music history to music majors. And I also teach music appreciation to non-majors. I wrote this textbook for non major music appreciation students. And throughout my seven years of writing this text, I used it in my classes. Uh, even from the very beginning, I just began with a framework of topics and some pedagogical sections, such as vocabulary and musical instrument sections. And my publisher got permissions for my favorite reading. So I began as an editor um, of you know just my favorite readings that I found. And then I was able to write chapters um, you know, most mostly in the summers, um, uh, one by one, and and take out the readings uh, as I went along. And I have to say that writing the book while teaching it was very good for the book. Uh, I knew as I went along what students re were responding to, and what did not work. And so I was constantly able to adjust for that. So that was a really good thing for the book. OK, so we go back then. Um, or I'm, I've got it upside down. That's what happened. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I, uh, I want to say about music appreciation in general, uh, the vast majority of music appreciation textbooks, and there are many good ones out there, actually, uh, cover Western art music. Um, or what we call classical music um, exclusively. Uh, sometimes with token additions from popular and world music, but that's very different than giving equal time to traditions outside of Western Europe. And I think it's not fair to, uh, to give only this relatively narrow range of topics under a generic title like music appreciation. So students are you know, walking into this course with a generic title, and then they're only learning about classical music. Um, and and um, and I know I'm, music is not the only field that does this sort of thing. And I, I really didn't want to base the text on Western art music. I wanted my course to look more like my students. So my text covers uh, these three general areas. Uh, starts with um, American vernacular music in, the, in, in unit one, uh, which is the most familiar music to most of my students. And in my course, this is where I teach the most basic musical elements, uh, such as scales, chords, uh, meter, and so on. And ver vernacular music is basically all the 
the most familiar music uh, to Americans, popular music, stage music, screen music, and so on, jazz. Um, and then the second unit is the more traditional music appreciation topic with a chronological flow. And this is where I describe musical elements in more detail. And then the third wor uh, unit on world music, uh, this is the least familiar music to most of my students. It's the last in the course after students have more conceptual tools to understand musical elements and uh, historical and co social contexts. And here I describe musical elements. Uh, I review them and I also look at them in light of cultural context. Uh, for instance, Middle Eastern or South Asian scales are completely different from the scales they learned in Unit 1. Okay. But what I want to talk about most uh, in uh, today is the idea of a canon. Um, uh, most, if not all, music appreciation texts use a fixed set of musical examples. And, and I wondered if fixed examples tied us all, uh, oh. students as well as professors, into a canon, uh, museum pieces on a pedestal, uh, iconic, harder to interact with because they're better than we are, uh, composed by these untouchable geniuses. Um, the first chapter, probably the first couple of chapters of Dewey's art as experience very powerfully persuades about this idea. He mostly talks about visual arts, but it's the same sort of idea. Um, and by the way, a canon, uh, uh, you know, it does not have to be comprised of white Europeans. It's really, it could be anybody we elevate, right, to students. Um, and, and I don't mean any judgment or disrespect against the people in the canon. Uh, in fact, my personal specialty as a scholar is 16th and 17th century European music. So I love most of these composers, and, uh, and, and as I do Duke Ellington. Um, but, uh, but, but it made me wonder, uh, is the music appreciation textbook, um, in the music appreciation textbook, is the fixed canonic set of musical examples necessary? Is it really helpful to students? Um, instead, what if we empower students to search for and assess music themselves? Um, would this be more engaging and maybe more pedagogically sound? So in my textbook, I use playlist options sections instead of fixed musical examples. And I don't know of any other music appreciation text that does this. Uh, throughout the text, after every genre description, and you can say after every lecture um, as well, um, I have a playlist options section that includes the subject sections find, observe, and ask. And these, uh, this example of a film music playlist options section is truncated to fit on a slide. Um, uh, there's usually more in the find and observe. I give people, uh, in the find section, I provide online search terms and names and advice on how a student can search for her own examples. In the observe section, I direct the student to listen for musical elements performance practices, uh, social, historical, context, uh, contextual aspects, using the very course vocabulary and concepts that I, that I write about in that section or that I talk about in my lecture. Um, and, and note that I put the course vocabulary in bold font. And usually has more like, this is truncated again, um, I usually have like about, about a handful of terms that they just learned about in their genre section. And then in the ask section, I provide some thoughtful questions about all of the above. So here's a real student example of the playlist options on film scores. Got her permission to use it anonymously. She found a scene from the most recent Great Gatsby film. Now this student uses the vocabulary terms appropriately. I would, right away, I was really happy with this because she uses them um, in a way that she got the meaning, she understood. And she put them in bold font as I assigned. And, um, but also one thing that was kind of amusing to me was the last sentence of this. Um, she put her own as opposed to my interests. Um, and it really comes through in that last sentence, um, which I kind of laughed at. Um, this is why the two, 2013 version appeals as opposed to the older version, which looks boring. <laughs> so, um, but uh, but the, the point here is that when you write a textbook, um, 
is going to tend to be just the author's voice. Uh, but we'll help the student more, I think, if we can somehow give them windows or doorways uh, in the assignments, uh, at least, to raise their own voices on the topics and make their own discoveries. She's transferring her new knowledge of the terms to her own examples that she found for herself. And I think she's more engaged that way. I believe that this student is more likely to remember these vocabulary terms than if I had asked her to regurgitate what I told her in the text about film music examples that I chose to write about and interpret. And then I just want to point out a few of the topics in my book. I'll, I'll, I'll just um, mention one in each unit. Um, uh, unit one, I start describing, for instance, the banjo's African heritage and its journey um, <clears throat> from West Africa to the Americas. Um, I actually end up touching on this topic in all three units. So the banjo is a kind of symbolic unifying element in my text. And, um, and, and also in unit one, I do mention, um, I, I, I talk in several of the chapters about genre labels. I teach caution with pop music genre labels. For instance, some refer to musical style, um, some more to the color of the performer's skin than the musical style. So, you know, it's, it's, I, I try to teach students, you know, wh which is which and what's going on there. Unit two, this is the, the classical music chapter. Um, uh, I'm, I'm putting up Florence Beatrice Price, uh, including, um, I, I, in, in the book I have a, um, a le rather lengthy quote from a letter that she wrote asking for the, um, the director of the Boston Symphony to, to look at her work in spite of the fact that she's, this is the 1930s, in spite of the fact that she's not only a woman, but she's a black woman. She didn't phrase it that way in the 1930s, but she asks for that and she's appealing for that and uh, never got an answer and to this day. Boston Symphony has not um, played any of her work. She was a single mother with, who struggled financially with many jobs, including accompanying silent films on Barrel, Oregon. You see the dates, her dates, she's in that early film era. Um, nevertheless, she wrote large-scale works, including a prize-winning symphony. Her work was respected in her lifetime internationally. Despite problems getting published, again, a black female composer, she wasn't going to be looked at. Um, and after she died, reception just disappeared. This was very frustrating to write about. I mean, normally when you find a gap in the literature and uh, you're the first one who's writing a tech, write, you know, putting someone in their textbook. Um, it's kind of exciting, but this was um, too depressing. You know? It was also hard to find out about her. There wasn't a lot about her, and there is a revival underway, though. Um, but I didn't, it was very frustrating and painful that I didn't notice any other music appreciation or music history for majors. Uh, uh, she wasn't in any of those textbooks uh, the year that I finished this chapter. But as I say, there are efforts underway to get her music published. And I think especially with this documentary, The Caged Bird, um, you can, if you, if you get a chance to see that, you can hear her music. It's very beautiful. And then finally, um, in the third unit, uh, indigenous voices in Oceania um, include Lili Uokalani. She was Hawaii's last reigning monarch before the U.S. takeover in, 19, in 1893. She was an author, a composer, a vocalist, and an instrumentalist. She thought of herself very much as a musician as well as a political figure. And she was an advocate for both indigenous and Asian Hawaiians. Her famous uh, Aloha Oi means fare, farewell to thee. She's the one that wrote that. And I bet a lot of people in this room, if you don't if you, if, if you don't recognize it just by my saying it, I bet if you heard the melody, you'd recognize it. It's very common and recognizable. It reflects her Western-style music education from missionaries that, you know, from the time she was little. But she also composed many traditional chants that blended Hawaiian and European musical idioms. So that's an idea of Gateway's topics and approaches. Uh, to anyone here who's working on a project, I wish you lots of strength, patience, and luck. Thanks for listening. Thank you. We uh, are going to hold questions to the very end. At the very end, we'll have time for a question and answer session with the entire panel. So if you do have a question, 
uh, for Jocelyn, you can just wait to the very end and then maybe there'll be some insight from the other presenters as well. So I'd like to turn this over now to our next uh, group of presenters. And this would be for the book, Data Structures and Abstractions with Java with uh, Frank and Tim. Hi, uh, our book is right now in the fifth edition. Uh, Tim and I were colleagues at the University of Rhode Island, and along the way I retired from teaching from there, and Tim moved on to New England Institute of Technology, and we became co-authors at about the, well, at the fourth edition of our book, so this is the second oh. time that Tim and I are working together. Uh, go on. Um, we want to look at a couple of the pedagogical features that we have in our book. We chunk the material. This was done in the first edition of the book, a long time ago before I ever heard of the word chunking. Our book has uh, about 30 chapters to it. We were doing small chapters, not really long chapters. And the text itself consists of small pieces of, of prose and each one, is, which I call segments, and each one is numbered just for reference so that you can refer back to it. And the idea is that each little segment is one concept, so you're introducing things very, very slowly. And uh, we can, uh, Tim will talk more about the modularity of it the fact that we can swap things around very easily. We just want to point to the thing at the end. A lot of our examples are, are real life kinds of examples. We've, we've been adding these uh, as we've been going along with the, the more recent editions. All right, there's a, a lot of different features we have that make it unique in our textbook. Uh, first, I just want to, this, you can't really read all the detail here, but this is kind of uh, from the prelude the list of all the interesting features that we have, uh, pedagogical features in the book. Uh, based on Kevin's talk yesterday, we're going to add hints and how to use these uh, in the next edition. Uh, I thought that was a really great idea uh, in his book. So we're going to explain to students how important these are, not just what they are here. Uh, but as far as the other features, the design decisions, flexible chapter ordering, and video notes, we're going to get to uh, in a lot more detail in a minute. Uh, I want to call out the security notes for safe and robust and secure programming. Uh, that's something that's really unique to this textbook. It's geared for second semester students in computer science. Uh, they'll have one introductory programming course, typically in Java or maybe Python. And then they'll take uh, this course. It gets into data structures, designing uh, data structures and algorithms. And so we want to emphasize as early as possible safe ways to program because we all know computer security is a huge issue. But a lot of times students aren't taught that till maybe their last quarter. Oh, by the way, here's a secure programming course. Uh, what's, by that time, they've already developed a lot of poor habits in programming. So we want to try to introduce the good habits as early as possible in the book. So we call those out with special uh, icons in the, the book, uh, special notes. We have about 20 or so of those throughout the textbook. And then, uh, as Frank mentioned earlier, we have uh, exercises in particular areas. It's not all theoretical exercises as you go through. And then we used to have uh, self-test questions in the book. But with this edition, we changed it to be group study questions to encourage students that when they, they're going through it to study together and uh, to reinforce their learning through peer learning. Uh, as a way to encourage, you know, different ways and perspectives to look at the and learn the material, because learning from us isn't always the best way for students. Okay, design decisions. Um, back in the third edition, I, I introduced this. We had uh, a feature called a problem solved, and this was like case studies in other books. We stated a problem, and then we went through the solution, talking about the design of it, and then finally the implementation of it in Java. And you all know that early learners think there's only one way of doing things. And so what we're trying to, to impress upon them is that there are lots of ways of doing things. 
and the, from the problem solved, I've introduced this element, the design decision, to try to talk about the ideas that I had while I was solving this problem. Because in a case study, you say, here's the problem, here's the solution. Well, where did that come from? Try to describe my thought process as we were going along. And a really neat thing happened when Tim came on board in the fourth edition. As we started developing these examples, you know, we would draft solutions, you know, talking back and forth, and we would come up with two different approaches. And we'd go back and forth, well, which way is good, kind of have a little argument about it, and all of a sudden it would be, oh, that's another design decision, and we would invent a design decision and try to write down what we actually did, trying to get students to understand that there are lots of ways of doing at it. This is what we decided to do. It isn't necessarily the best way of doing it, but that's what we decided to do, and that's why we decided to do it. Yes, that's good. Yes, Frank and I come from very different backgrounds, and I think that led to much more dynamic discussions, too, as we went through these. Uh, the topic category, categorization had, uh, Frank had started a little bit of this with the third edition, but whenever I came on in the fourth and fifth, we've really emphasized it because we cover four real general areas in the textbook, and, and most uh, second semester computer science textbooks do this. You talk about designing the data structures. How do you design these different things, queues, stacks, lists, uh, trees, different things like that. Then you have to implement them. But the implementation is very language dependent. So a lot of times you'll get a course like this that's in Java or a book like this that's data structures in Java. You have another that might be data structures in C++ or one in Python. So this is the book in Java. So our implementation chapters are very Java specific because we're implementing it in the Java language. Then also the main category we have to cover, another we have to cover is algorithms, things like sorting, searching, uh, hashing, recursion, different topics like that. Those are all usually crunched into a second semester computer science course. So what we did is we broke it out. So instead of combining the design and the implementation of, let's say, a tree in one chapter, we made them two separate chapters and tried to make the design chapter as language independent as we could with all the language heavy stuff in the implementation piece. Also, that gave us the opportunity to have what we call Java interludes. So students come into this with just one semester of Java programming. There's a lot more advanced programming skills they're going to need. But that's not necessarily important to actually designing or building these data structures. So we separated out the language-specific pieces into what are called Java interludes. And so we have our uh, scaffolding for the chapters, the way order we would like to see it in, basic data structures, design, implement, design, implement, then a little bit more language or algorithms that you need to get to the next level, design, implement, and so on as you go through the, check, the textbook. But not every author likes to do that that way. Some like to do all, implement, all design first, then all implementation, and then maybe algorithms. Or some maybe, maybe like to take algorithms first or mix it up a little bit different ways. So we decided to try to reduce as many cross-chapter dependencies as we could and make it so that, now this is, these are color-coded by what category. Uh, the actual chapter numbers are almost going across on this. Uh, so we came up with a number of different ways. I thought I advanced, there we go. Uh, and we put it in the instructor guide. These are different orderings depending on how you like to cover these topics in your course. So, you know, this is our topic ordering here for a 15 week course. This is the way you cover those topics. Then, if you like to do, let's say, all your design stuff first, then do implementations and then do algorithms, what you do is this ordering. Or if you like to do algorithms first because you're really a math heavy person, you do this ordering. And then on the far side, we have, okay, to get through this week, you need to have at least this much Java. And then they can cover those special Java interludes or mini chapters uh, whenever it's needed. 
And so I think one of the, in June's presentation yesterday, she said like 70% of the instructors changed the order of the topics in the textbook and another 70% don't cover all the chapters. But what we really tried to do is, is gear towards that demographic, I guess, of instructor so that whatever order, however they like to teach the course, it's really easy to pull the chapters out in that way. Then another feature is uh, video notes. We've done a number of different videos to demonstrate the algorithms uh, that we talk about throughout. Now, a lot of, of computer science textbooks will show the instructor in their videos just like typing out all the code and explaining what it does as it goes along. What we tried to do in, in our videos is do an animation of the algorithm that's being implemented over in the code so that those two pieces go together. Now, because a lot of algorithms and implementing data structures is dynamically, you know, understanding what's going on in the code and what the different pieces that you're playing with. And that's what we do here. That led into the idea of instead of having figures that are labeled with arrow one, or an arrow has a label one, another arrow has a label two, another arrow has a label three, to show the different steps, is to break the figures out into a number of different steps so that the students can visually see that first step, then they visually see the second, then the third, then the fourth, instead of crunching it all together and then having a bunch of arrows showing, okay, this is what happens in the first, this is what happens in the second, this is what happens in the third. Okay. I just want to mention a couple other things. Uh, by breaking specification and implementation separately allowed us to have smaller chapters. Um, and when I first did this, particularly with the, the numbered segments, I, the numbered segments I got pushed back from reviewers. They thought it was a stupid idea at the time. And the number of chapters, you get a little pushback from production because increasing the number of chapters, there's, there's overhead. There's the beginning of the chapter, there's the end of the chapter, all of the stuff that you usually put in. It, it doubles it, so you have to worry about the book length. And then uh, you can see on this slide just uh, the layout of the textbook. It, the previous edition had another color. It was kind of blue. How much time? One minute? Okay. Uh, they asked us to remove the color. So we had a lot of work to do there. So uh, is there anything else you want to hit, Frank? Are these? No. Okay, yeah, just we have a number of different instructor resources, and we moved a bunch of uh, former appendices online in PDFs to give us more room in the book to do what Frank was talking about. Okay, great. Thank you. And then our third presentation is uh, one that we um, just uh, need to switch over to a different, uh, there it is. So I'm going to turn this over here to Monica and Okay, hello everybody. Uh, so you can see that we have two publications up there and uh, we're so proud to be here. This is Dave Hall, he's our divine de design supervisor and um, I'm one of the writers and we both work at Studies Weekly now. So we, as an elementary school textbook publishing company, mostly elementary I should say, we're really, you know, kind of anomaly here at TAA because all of you are usually higher ed. So we're really happy to be included in this award system and this presentation and at this conference. So it's wonderful to be here. So I was a classroom teacher for many, many years. I used Studies Weekly in my own class and I had no idea what Studies Weekly was, but I knew I wanted to be a writer and a published writer, not just a, a writer for my students. So when I got my studies weekly one time, there was a letter on there that said, hey, teachers, if you want to uh, try to be a writer for studies weekly, send us a writing sample. And I thought, well, that's an unusual way to recruit writers, but I'll go for it. I thought nothing would come of it. But a few weeks later, I got a phone call. And this was back in 
2010, and I don't know if you remember, way back in 2010, we used to have landlines at our houses, and we used to get lots of calls from telemarketers. So my 13-year-old son answered the phone, and uh, the editor-in-chief, Kathy, said, hi, I'm Kathy from Studies Weekly, and I'm with American Legacy Publishing, and I'd like to talk to your mom, please. And he, being the well-trained son of mine, said, sorry, we're not interested. <laughs> well, I didn't know who it was. I said, who was that? And he said, oh, some telemarketer. So <laughs> thankfully, she called right back again and said, really, I really need to talk to your mom. Um, I want to talk to her about a job. <laughs> and he says, Mom, it's that chick again. <laughs> and so I grabbed the phone and I said, hello. And she said, I'm Kathy Hoover from Studies Weekly, and I'd love to offer you a job <laughs> if you don't hang up on me. Um, so uh, the rest is history. I, you know, I'm so thankful that, that she did that. But I, so I started freelancing for Studies Weekly, still using it in my classroom. Uh, I started doing every single thing I could possibly do for Studies Weekly, from, from writing student editions to writing assessments. I just took any job that they would give me. So they started calling me the Duchess of Doable after a while. That was my nickname. And it was really helpful, though, because I learned all of the different facets of writing. I learned different styles, different subjects. We have social studies, we have science, we have civil rights publications. So um, I wasn't about to say no to anything. I was willing to learn anything. So that kind of helped me get more jobs. And then they kept pestering me till I finally went full time with Studies Weekly and resigned from teaching after many, many wonderful, beautiful years. There we go. So there you see some covers of some of the other publications. We have about 135 publications, which is more publications than we have people working at our company. And being elementary uh, in nature for the most part, we have publications like, say we, we have a state like Oklahoma, we do one for kindergarten, one for first grade, one for second grade, one for third grade. The state history ones, like the one we won this award for, are, are really specialized and customized. And the rest of them are, are a little bit customized for each state. Uh, so there's all kinds of things to learn. Doing this Oklahoma and New Mexico, we got to do wonderful research and just developed a huge adoration for US history and the history of the West. So I can't, I can't even begin to tell you how much I've learned doing all of the different states. And we are in all 50 states. So you get to, to experience all sorts of different things. So that's kind of cool. One of the things that makes us really unusual is that we're hands-on, ready to use for teachers and for students. As you can see, we're just a uh, four-page paper. Let me set that down. And we send between 32 and 36 of these four-page papers to the schools. We send them all at one time. Several of you have asked me, hey, you know, how can you ship all of those papers? Just ship them and ship them. So we, we just put them all in a big stack, ship them all at the beginning of the year, and that way the teachers and the students can use them in the order that they want. And we're also standards-based. Uh, I have to do a lot of research on the different state standards since we do have so many different states that we deal with. Some of you might have looked at our publication and said, oh, I remember having a little newspaper like that. On Fun Friday, the teacher would give us these. Okay, did anybody think that? That's not what this is. This is a genuine textbook. It's a standards-based textbook. We cover 100% of the standards for the school year. So that, that does make it a little bit different and does require a lot more research. Yeah, long ago. It's also interactive. Uh, yesterday, I know I heard June talking a lot about OERs and about uh, digital platforms and things like that. We do everything. Um, 
we write the student editions for the print. We write the scripts for the videos. We write all sorts of different content. Um, we have interviews with all sorts of people. And we obviously have to write the transcripts of those and the questions for them. And we write the assessments. So I get to do all sorts of different kinds of writing. That way, it's never boring. It's always exciting. And there's always something really new to learn. And I want to turn this over to Dave so he can talk a little bit about the design elements. Thank you very much. Uh, one of the, since um, I've actually been working with Monica for several years, and we, we built this Oklahoma Studies Weekly together, um, one of the unique things about our company is that the designers actually have to take um, not as equal role as the writers, but we have to really accentuate what they want. Um, because there's so many historical things to research, we take a lot of the burden off getting the primary sources, researching the photography. Um, and then if we can't find a primary source, our job is still to illustrate the concepts. And we, so we create them all. So if we have something that does not exist or we're trying to teach a concept for the kids, our team actually illustrates and finds the photographs. We write a lot of the activities. We do all the maps in-house. We have our own design team that helps to make sure that the writers cover the standards and the art helps them cover it because a lot of standards these days are now based with primary source analysis, um, illustrating the concepts, being able to recreate them. So we work very closely with the writers um, in teams. So we all work together to make sure that each week is um, the way they want it. The activities are done the way that the kids need it. We help write the captions. We help do the research. So it's, it's one of the most fun things. I know way too much about dumb stuff in every state I've worked on, which is uh, about 35 of them, um, <laughs> which drives my kids nuts. Um, but every single thing um, from, uh, that I do personally is to uh, take it home and show my kids. And if they don't like it, then I change it. And I've done that for a lot of years. Uh, my own kids have used it. Um, so it's, it's one of the, the best things about working uh, for a company is to be so closely tied with the writers and with the, with the owners, with the, um, the illustrators and, and everybody, and just gathering up and brainstorming how's the best way to teach these concepts. Because elementary school kids today are so, you know, locked in on, on their stuff. And if you don't grab their attention in a fun way, then, then you've kind of lost them. So we, my job is to bring them back in and say, hey, history's cool, whether you like it or not. So, um, so that's my, my uh, working relationship with Monica. And I'm, I'm so glad we've, we've won these because they really do become labors of, uh, of love and have been for me personally for 12 years. And, um, and I just love showing up and seeing what next topic and what, what state we're hitting next. So makes it very exciting and unique for me as an individual and professional. So, Thank you, Dave. I just want to add one, one more little thing that I thought of. Um, I notice when you're talking about your books, most of you are so drilled in and focused on a topic. And it's just incredible to experience the amount of expertise you have. And just to know that there's somebody out there that knows every dang thing about that subject. Really cool. <laughs> but since we write for elementary school, one of the things that we have to really, really do is think about different subjects at the same time. So we can't just say we're going to teach Oklahoma history or something like that. We have to focus on things like language arts, too. So we have uh, little things like this cowboy story activity on the back of the paper that people can incorporate the, the history information into a language arts activity. So we kind of spread out more, whereas some of you kind of drill in more. So it's a little bit different for us. Um, as Dave said, we, we are a, a tight-knit group. We work really closely together. We're like a big, big family at Studies Weekly, and uh, we love our jobs. Thank you.
Well, thank you, Monica and Dave. And uh, now this uh, begins the uh, question and answer session, and we have about 15 minutes left in our session. So we would love to have some questions here. Is there someone that's going to uh, take the microphone here? And then I will pass the other microphone to the to the appropriate people. If this is for just a general or specific, uh, either one would be good. So let's start in. Well, th this was really fun to see. Um, I have uh, done some webinars and, and written some things for the TAA stuff around ancillary materials. So w one of my questions to you is, are, are your materials uh, hosted on the publisher's website or somewhere else, and you know, how do you have any way of tracking uh, the use of those materials? Um, right. I can just say um, I have ancillaries. I have a full set of ancillaries that are available to adopters through my publisher, and um, I haven't thought about tracking that, but that. That seems I, I do in my ancillaries in my um, letter to uh, doctors. I I include my email and encourage them to contact me so I can help them answer questions or or field any concerns they have. That's a good question. Yeah, I I was going to say for our ancillaries, they're on the publisher's website. The video notes or the videos are behind a paywall for the students. So they have to actually purchase access to those. Uh, other student resources are there for students to download. Uh, we don't have any way to track it ourselves, what, uh, what's downloaded. Uh, on the sales side of our site, I believe we can still see every single publication we have, but it's in an encrypted PDF. Um, so you can, any teacher can see, but getting the teacher resources and that stuff, you have to be a subscriber to get those on the back end. Yeah, I have a question for each one of you uh, that's written books. Uh, the young lady that wrote the book on music, uh, I think it's a great idea to engage the students to go off and to discover on their own a music piece. And then I think you said use some of the definitions and the terms in your text to sort of bring that into the description of the music. Um, and I think it's also good because you've got your students working to try to find resources for you as well to build your book for a further edition. Yeah. It's a great idea. <laughs> Thank you, um, but I wondered if you had some tunes, uh, for example, in the first part of your book, are you teaching them the fundamentals of music and the listening of it, I think you said. Uh, do you have on the publisher's website some guidance as to uh, what those tunes would be like or so on? Or are you just describing things in words about the music and the development of it in the early stages? I'm just wondering if you build off of that as well. Well, in the book, um, and I, no, I do not have um, music on a website. So I don't do that. In the book, um, I uh, talk about specific musical works and musicians and describe them. And then with the playlist options, I encourage them to find their own. And in my course that I teach, I, I pick out musical examples. Um, but I do that. I do, so I do actually pr provide musical examples, uh, like I sort of say not to, but I do with a, uh, with a much lighter touch than, you know, uh, than most textbooks uh, encourage. And I, and I have assignments where they need to find their own. I see. Well, I, I'm not in your course to see the samples to use, but perhaps maybe that could be considered in a further edition to have that available to other professors to use as samples. Just a thought. Yeah, I do, I, in, the, in the find section, I, I, I provide a lot of uh, suggestions. I see. You know, like for, for in symphonic works, I provide a lot of specific uh, composers and composers' works and so on. But, and the students can choose from a field. So I they're see. not completely at sea. Okay, and to the two gentlemen that wrote the book on uh, JavaScript, uh, in the beginning you mentioned that you number the sections, I believe, with a number so you can better organize references. To me, that seems like you would just have a section number 
with a title after the section. Isn't that the best way to define that? Or you just have numbers no, in your there are, there are section numbers also and subsection, not with numbers, I'm sorry, section titles and subsection titles. But th these are little this long, like a few lines uh -huh. called a segment. Okay. You might call it a paragraph, but they might be more than, might be two paragraphs. And they're just numbered. The number does two things. It calls out that here's a new concept. I'm going to read this and try to understand it, okay, before I go on. It's not just a sea of blur words, okay. It's chunked. Okay. And the numbers also allow added benefit. You should read, you know, segments 1.8 through 1.12 for tomorrow, something like that. Or in segment 1.8, notice this. I see. So okay. that's a convenience. So you refer to the segment with a number then, essentially. Yeah, it's just out in the margin. Okay. Yeah. And then you mentioned the algorithms uh, that you talk about as examples. Do you give the student an opportunity to also fill in those uh, statements? as you noted by the arrows on the algorithm, you were mentioning how when you build your script up and how you indicate what each uh, one of those different uh, writings are for your um, so your software? Not not in the video notes, no. You don't? Oh. No, the video notes just let, you know, like the animations, examples. I see. They would practice uh, building their own in our programming projects. Okay, that's off on the website or something, right? Well, no, it's in the back of the book. Oh, it is? I mean, back of the chapters, yeah. Oh, okay. Final question had to do with uh, the uh, two uh, people that mentioned their study guides for um, grammar school use. Um, you said you have interactive uh, activities there. Can you explain to me exactly what the interactive uh, portion of those activities is and how it works? We uh, the interactive portion of our online product is actually really robust because of the requirements that uh, elementary schools place on us these days. Every article is online, read to the students for children that with reading disabilities. Um, a lot, we're starting to get more and more into ESL, so they're even translated for them. It highlights it for them so that kids of all reading abilities can also follow along with it. The activities are done online. We have over a thousand um, mini documentaries that we've made in-house uh, from our filmmaker, uh, Loki Mulholland, uh, who is the son of a civil rights activist and a phenomenal uh, filmographer. Um, and so those are all extra bonuses that are all free with the subscription rate. So everything on our online product, um, all the teacher supplements, everything comes with each publication for the teacher. Uh, to do with however they want with their uh, various students. We even have free leveled readers for them uh, that also help with the language arts based on social studies and all that. So it's, it's uh, the, the next phase we're, we're trying to get more activities and more ability to do those um, to help the teachers even more. But uh, everything that is in the paper um, and some is all online for the teachers to use as they want. First, thank you. Um, this is kind of everybody. The thing I'm thinking about is um, what measures do you take to ensure that students actually engage and utilize the new features the way that you want them? Because there's lots of evidence that suggests students don't use conventional features from headings to boxes. There's all kinds of things they, that are there and they would actually have some experience with but don't use. Uh, what do you do to get them to actually use, engage and use these things the way you want them to? One of the things we do at Studies Weekly is to offer professional development. Every time a school district adopts our publication or even purchases our publication, we send trainers there to teach them how uh, to use the features in the publication and to display the different types of things they can do in the classroom, give them sample lessons, um, and, and we don't just come one time, we come back uh, again later to make sure that everything's going well. We also teach them how to use our online component should they be so inclined, um, and more and more, of course, each year are, are so inclined. So we don't just leave them on their own and just say, here's your paper, you know, good luck. Uh, and 
since many of our authors are former teachers and former educators and current educators even, um, we kind of know both sides of what is going on. So that's really, really helpful. We've been on each side of the paper, basically. I was going to say, for our textbook, it's more of a, the idea of universal design of learning. Students learn a, a number of different ways. So some students will engage by actually reading, maybe five. Uh, and then others <laughs> will engage by, re by watching the videos. While others, uh, there's a large number of projects they can work on. You know, in computer science, that's one of the, they love that kind of thing usually, and so to jump into the projects. But also the study groups for the students. So there's an opportunity for the students to work together. I mean, we can't force them sitting here as authors, but we can give them a lot of different opportunities or forms that they can learn the material. Uh, and that's kind of what we tried to do. Um, just, um, I, I think about a lot of different kinds of learners when I'm um, uh, with the textbook in terms of visuals and how things are laid out, but also with my syllabi, uh, which are also part of my um, ancillaries. Um, I chart out um, grade weights and things like that. And, and so, so the way I design um, I guess the way I design uh, the information I provide, I, I try to think about different types of learners that way. Does anyone else have a question? All right. I actually have a couple questions. <laughs> um, my first question is kind of short. Um, how often do you update the Studies Weekly product? So you, do you look at it? Because it seems to be something that you could do on a you could revise pretty easily because it's not a whole textbook that you're printing. So are you doing like every year do you make changes to it? Normally, yes. Mm -hmm. um, that makes it really easy. You know, if a governor changes or something happens, we can add that in or, or revise that. Or if we just um, have a st uh, change in standards from a school district or a state, we can update for that. Um, sometimes the state adoptions won't allow us to update every single year. They might say you have to wait for two years or something. Uh, so we have to abide by that. But yeah, one of the advantages of this is doing it every year. And since it's consumable, the, the teachers and the students are expecting to get a new copy anyway. Oh, so okay. It's really yeah. nice. And then um, you had said that um, you know, you felt kind of unusual here at TAA because you're in more in the K-12 space. And, you know, that is because uh, um, most of the materials being written K-12 through are being written by author teams at publishing companies like Pearson or Sungage. So you're kind of, you are unusual in, you know, in the industry. But there are a few, like yourself, um, like Big Ideas Learning um, is doing it, is one of our members that does it. And then also like Joy Akeem kind of broke into it by being able to um, break into that textbook adoption process and navigate through it in order to come up with a series, that kind of thing. So I, my question is around that. Um, how hard has it been to navigate that state adoption process with your product and, um, you know, uh, is it as scary as everyone thinks on the outside? I mean, can you give us any insight into that? Sure. I've been through several adoptions, and some of them are, are more rigorous than others. Some of them uh, require a lot of hoop jumping, so it can be very stressful. But as long as you follow the rules and follow uh, the, the requirements as far as the <clears throat> ancillary standards and things like that, the, the frameworks, things that are in addition to the state standards, then you have it made. And we spend an awful lot of time um, in pre-production doing research and making sure we're doing the right thing and following curriculum maps. And we, we even write the lesson plans and the teacher supplements too. So we have the entire package presented so we can show, you know, with our print edition, our teacher supplement, and our digital edition all together that we're covering everything and we, we're um, making sure to provide education for all sorts of learners. Yeah, just a little bit, because um, it's, it's a huge shout out to the um, owner of the company, uh, because 
we we didn't think we were going to be eligible for adoptions until he said, why not? And so we, we had to go through a lot of trial and error. We won uh, in some of our popular states um, early on, um, but then we lost a few. And so it was it was really figuring out who we were as a company, what we can do, um, what the what the school boards expect. Um, and then we have a dedicated team that works with the upcoming adoption, so we make sure we know exactly. Um, because you're right, when you're going against Pearson or you know somebody like that, we were just showing up, and but we were we were starting to win, um, just because we really took pride in what we did, and we listened to what the teachers and the school boards expected, and and we just said we do cover you and so it's it's been a it's been a lot of fun uh, helping something like this grow from when i started and it was black and white and <laughs> really really bad and to help create something really great out of it but a, a lot of it is paying attention to teachers and school boards and administrators and knowing what they want and and helping them with what they need so Um, I just wondered for Frank and Timothy, how do you logistically keep track of keeping it updated between editions, or do you wait, or how do you move from, okay, this this edition is out, but I know my publisher is going to want another one in two years. Are you revising every time some new news comes in or new information? Do you sit down and do it periodically? What do you do? Um, actually, before the book is even published, we've already started a folder of gee, we should have done it this way, or I found a mistake, or here's an idea, let's do this. And so by the time the next edition comes around, we have an entire big list, and that's what we attack first. Plus the book then goes out to review, and uh, this edition would go out to reviewers, and, and they will choose usually a couple that are adopters and a couple who haven't adopted it, and ask them why didn't you? And so we'll react to that, decide whether we like what they say, and, and decide what it is that we're going to do. So. And, that's partly where the idea of moving the oh. and that's partly where the idea of moving the chapters around came from, is the doctors saying, well, I'd rather have it this way, I'd rather, and others saying, I'd rather have it that way, and trying to please as many people as we could. Well, great. Let's have a nice round of applause for our panel.